Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Exceptionally pleased to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Russell Napier of Orlock Advisors and author of the Solid Ground publication. Russell, well enough to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Jack. It's good to be back. I'm really glad you are back. Russell, the last time we spoke, we talked about the Asian financial crisis of the mid to late 1990s and how that augured in a period of, of monetary change. I think at this juncture, you think that there will be a monetary change as well coming out of Asia, China, and Japan. Before we we get into that, can you first tell us about how do you spot a change in monetary policy and what what triggers it? Is it a fall in in, in bond prices, a widening of credit spreads, a a fall of an equity index to a certain valuation? What sort of patterns do you see when you look back and, and scan the historical record? Yeah, so it's important to begin with, this is uh, what we're looking at is potentially a change in the structure of monetary policy. This is not about why interest rates go up or why interest rates are coming down. It's something much more fundamental. So let's give us start with some examples to give us some idea of how momentous this would be. So the end of the gold standard, for instance, which for the UK was 1931, for America was 1933. For some people, the heavens had fallen and the world would never be the same again. Uh, we then have the construction of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, and that starts to operate in ways that were not expected. It turns out it was much more inflationary than the gold standard, and very few people really understood that uh, early on in its creation. By 1971, it falls apart. It is the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, I argue, and I think we argued last time, Jack, that a new system was created in, in 1994. So it's not as if this happens every day. This is not a thing to do with the business cycle. So if we go back through all of those, and then we say, well, why did they happen? What was it? that drove all of these things. And and obviously what it was is the structure of the monetary system produced outcomes that politicians weren't happy with. Now, they could have been deflationary outcomes or inflationary outcomes, but it was a monetary policy setting that was delivering economic outcomes that were unlikely to get its proponents re-elected. And suddenly they changed. So the most spectacular one, of course, would have been Roosevelt and the gold standard who campaigned to stay on the gold standard was elected in 32, didn't get into office until 33, uh, and then moved away from that. In the case of America, on that occasion, it was pretty obvious why uh, Roosevelt wanted to get out of the debt deflation that the uh, the gold standard was causing. So, so that's how rare they are, but that's not really that rare. So in any investor's lifetime, they really could expect to see one of these and have to live one of these. Uh, and I think it's just a great misfortune for the current generation that they're going to have to live through one. I think most people realize that the structure of the world is changing. But yet, for some reason, they don't look at this issue of the structure of the global monetary system. They look at trade. Uh, They might look at capital flows. They obviously look at geopolitics. Uh, But history tells us that these things come rarely. But when they come, they have profound changes which ring for decades, not for quarters or years, but for, for decades. And it seems that we're about to live through one of those. And therefore, it's more important than the merely cyclical uh, if and when it comes. So the U.S. going off the gold standard in 1933 was one of these instances of a momentous monetary shift, a change in regime, not just a move in in interest rates, but a a true secular shift, as you say. Another was the, as you call it on your your book, uh, which we spoke about last, the birth of the age of debt. Can you uh, review for our listeners what gave birth to the, the age of debt and how would you characterize it over the past three decades? Yeah, the, the global monetary system is not much talked about because it's assumed that it doesn't exist. And uh, you know, for those of us who are a bit older or financial historians, you'll know that with the collapse of the Bretton Woods Agreement, there was about 20 years where we tried to fix it. And we tried to fix it with a rules-based system. So we had a thing at the Smithsonian. It was a thing called the SNAKE. This was global developed world countries getting together to try and come up with an agreement. Uh, we then had a thing in the 80s called the uh, Plaza Accord, the Louvre Accord. These were not rules-based systems, but they were agreements as to how um, a global monetary system would be managed. And then it just went silent. It just seemed to go silent forever. Uh, but it wasn't silent because there was a major decision taken in 1994 by the Chinese Communist Party. That first to devalue the exchange rate, but then to not allow it to appreciate. seemed like a, a fairly meaningless thing at the time because that economy was so small. 
that how could the interaction with a managed exchange rate by such a small economy have any impact on America whatsoever? But of course, what none of us could have foreseen was just how rapidly that economy would grow. And therefore, we did have a monetary system based around that. As we discussed last time, it forced the Asians to devalue in 97. They then decided to intervene to hold down their currencies throughout this most of this period as well. Japan was doing the same thing. Now, that's the crux of the global monetary system. So I guess some people would answer and say, but wait a minute, the Fed was independent and the Fed had an inflation target. Yes, absolutely correct. But the Fed was reacting to inflationary forces that were coming from China, coming from Asia. Uh, And if you like, they were the residual. They were what was left after the Chinese had determined their monetary policy, which was not to let the exchange rate go up. So just mechanically, the uh, Chinese and other Asian countries ended up buying a huge amount of treasuries, depressing uh, the yield curve. They ended up exporting deflation as they wouldn't let their exchange rates go up. Uh, They ended up overinvesting, particularly China, huge amounts of capital flowing into investment, also depressing global inflation. And throughout this, the Fed and other developed world central bankers had an inflation target, and they adjusted to this. So they were not the key drivers of the global monetary system. They were reacting to the foundations already put in place. Uh, The consequences were very high levels of leverage developed because debt was cheap relative to growth, uh, but also that asset prices did exceptionally well. That's what you would expect to happen if the discount rate is low relative to the growth rate. So most of the distortions that I think uh, those of us who've been around longer who saw these distortions build up, the cyclically adjusted PE going up to what looks like a permanently higher plateau, a famous quote from history. Mm -hmm some of your listeners will remember, they all began back when this all started, back in 94, 95, 96. And many of the peculiar and bizarre things we've seen then, I think, relate directly to this global monetary system we've now had in place for, well, it's almost exactly 30 years. So 30 years ago, China devalues the Chinese yuan against the dollar, fixes it at roughly 8.7 Chinese yuan to, to $1. So, Russell, is it correct to say that at that time, that was a somewhat artificially cheap rate for the yuan, which would make Chinese exports very competitive and would generate a substantially large trade surplus with the rest of the world, which is what we have seen? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. But we didn't appreciate how big, because what we didn't appreciate is how quickly Chinese resources could be mobilized. So remember, at the time of the devaluation, China was really not in the export business. But then it suddenly it moved hundreds of millions of people from the farm to industrial production. It, the capital that was needed, the financial capital that was needed to, move, to, to, to do that was huge, but it was able to do that through the state-run banking system. So it wasn't just that we knew it was cheap. It was just, it was able to mobilize resources and, and become a very big player very quickly. And at its peak, the current account surplus was 10% of GDP. And of course, when you're managing your exchange rate, you can also have a capital account surplus at the same time. And they did have that. They had a capital account surplus and a current account surplus at the same time. The balancing item when you intervene is your foreign exchange reserves. And they were poured into uh, primarily American treasuries, but developed world debt across the world. So China is now in the business as it gets bigger and bigger, as it mobilizes more resources, as its external surpluses, both capital and current, get bigger. It's in a business of really grossly distorting global interest rates, global inflation, and massively overproducing, and everything else balances around that. The Chinese uh, yuan was artificially cheap at, at uh, 19, 1994. Is it artificially cheap now or artificially expensive, and why? It, it's certainly not artificially cheap now. If we, rather than hypothesize, and that would mean doing a purchase in power parity calculation, if we just look at the condition of the external accounts, as a guide to whether this thing is overvalued or undervalued, uh, I think you come to the conclusion that it's overvalued. Now, we have to take it one uh, account at a time. So let's go to the current account first. It, it is now down to 1.5% of GDP. Uh, only on the eve of COVID, it had disappeared entirely. So it's at least we can say it's very small. Now, there are some artificial things going on here. The Chinese economy has not responded post-COVID the way others have. One of the ways to maintain a current account would be to have very low domestic growth. And China certainly has very low domestic growth by its own standards. I think we're all suspicious of the real rate of growth in China. That is actually what it's declared to be. But we know that consumer prices are, well, they were falling and now they're they're up marginally in the last data point. 
so if you depress consumption and depress growth, then you'd expect to have higher current. But even with that depression underway, it's only 1.5% of GDP down from 10% of GDP. And a large part of the deficit on that current account is tourism. Deficit's getting bigger more quickly. So on the current account, you could possibly argue that it is competitive, but it's certainly not very competitive. Uh, and then we have to throw in this second bit, which is structural in nature. The lesson that most corporations took from uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that we have to diversify the supply chains. But what if, because China's exports are contracting, what if that contraction is actually driven by this structural shift that I think we all know is underway to diversify away from China risk? Well, the current account could get a lot worse if that diversification continues. So it may be that the the low current account has something else. You know, so that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because it's not really about whether the currency is cheap or not. You know, if you have a major company like Apple diversifying its supply lines, it's not driven at all by the relative competitiveness of the Chinese exchange rate. It's driven by the fact that we could find ourselves with another Russia. So it may be that there's something more fundamental going on as well as the exchange rate level, which is undermining the condition of the external accounts. But they're not. it's not a robust surplus. It's a small surplus. And that's the current account. The capital account looks dreadful. Uh, most people will know that there's a, a restriction on how much money Chinese people can remove from China. Because of that, the balance of payments for China do not balance. There's a great big hole in them. Uh, it's called net errors and omissions. And you know every statistician struggles with this for the balance of payments for every nation. But China's is a particularly big hole. It has been for a long time. And it's widely assumed that this missing bit is the illegal capital outflow. So that remains large. But now we have the, the new problem. Foreigners are also removing their capital, probably because of that analogy with, uh, with Russia again. So now you've got a real problem on your external accounts. Uh, and it may be telling you something about the exchange rate, or it may just be telling you something about the forthcoming Cold War and a realignment of capital and a realignment of trade flows. And that means that running an exchange rate policy is really very inappropriate and very dangerous. If you're the second biggest economy in the world, a likely protagonist in this Cold War, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to have your currency linked to other currencies and accept that through the condition of your external accounts, those other parties get to play some role in determining your monetary policy. And we could have said that last year, the year before, the year before, the year before that, uh, but two things have changed. Uh, the geopolitical situation is worse, but the domestic economic condition of China has obviously started to deteriorate quite rapidly now. So these chickens are beginning to come home to roost. You know, and going back to the gold standard, why did Roosevelt ditch it? Why did he just, you know, not cut interest rates, not raise rates, just abandon the monetary system that, it, that America had been under really for a very long period of time? It's because it was grinding his economy into a deflationary contraction. And I think most people looking at the condition of China would say that a lot of the indicators, a lot of the symptoms are there, that, that, that Xi Jinping's China is rolling into a similar situation. So maybe the conditions are getting more ripe for him to reconsider the very structure of monetary policy itself. So a uh, current account is the same thing as a, a trade account. And historically, China ran a very large trade surplus with the US and the rest of the world. So folks in the US who may have heard the line that oh, we, you know, we owe China all this debt, China is going to demand uh, uh, the debt. That is what the trade deficit is referenced. But there's also the capital count. Normally, or often, I should say, they are on the other side of the shop. So you know, for example, the US runs a very large trade deficit, but we have a huge capital surplus, tons of money going into the United States. But interestingly, you said that China was running both a current account, that is to say a trade account surplus and a capital surplus. So where did all this money go? US treasuries. Now, both of those are going down. Is that is that? Yeah. So the balance of payments balances in America because you've got a flexible exchange rate. So it will, it will always add up and it will always balance that current account and the capital account will always balance. Uh, but it doesn't balance when you intervene in the exchange rate. So the current account and trade account are slightly different because the, the trade account would be goods, but the current account would be goods plus services, and that's different. So that's why the current account includes tourism, and that's actually very important in the Chinese external accounts. But you're right. The problem is the current account surplus is getting smaller, potentially for structural reasons, as we buy less from China for geopolitical risks, at the same time that the current the capital account is also getting worse. And I relate both things to why China isn't growing well, why China uh, 
the constant lament from foreign analysts is cut interest rates, print money. And they're being very lax on that. But I think they're very lax on that because they know the consequences for the exchange rate should they follow it. So it's the uh, it's the curse of a communist party that it thinks it can control everything. And, uh, you know, it can't. You can't control the price of money, the quantity of money, and the exchange rate all at the same time. But there is a party in power in China which is determined to do all of those. And it could get sort of get away with that when it ran huge external surpluses. So the absence of those surpluses is now what's restricting its monetary maneuverability. And I think that's what leads us to a structural change in how they run monetary policy. And based on our earlier conversation, that changes the world's monetary policy. In our first conversation two years ago, uh, Russell, we talked about how some of the Southeastern Asian economies, such as Thailand, had a a choice. They could either devalue their currency or they could deflate their economies and and have uh, basically a contractionary recession Similarly, in the 1920s, I mean, uh, Britain faced the same thing. Is it going to devalue the pound sterling or is it going to have a, a deflation, which is, you know, needless to say, very uncomfortable? Is that the trade off that Chinese monetary authorities face right now, or do they face a, a different uh, set of challenges, a different trade off? Yeah, I think that's the challenge. I think it always comes down to that. Uh, the British example you mentioned, the, the, the one I lived through was 1992. We were in a thing called the exchange rate mechanism. The Chancellor of the Exchequer went to his office that morning with no intention whatsoever of devaluing the exchange rate. But the markets pulled capital out. He intervened and interest rates went up. And they went to a level on that day when you knew that the consequence from that level of interest rates was debt deflation and distress. Now, it is interesting that that isn't what's happening in China yet. It's not as if we are yet putting upward pressure on interest rates. There may be reasons why China is trying to offset this with capital inflows from its banks or whatever. Uh, there are reasons why it may be able to get away with it in the short run, uh, but it is the same problem and it is the same outcome. Uh, and I think it's it's interesting to, to relate this to the stock market. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from the stock market about economics. Uh, Andrew Smithers has written a whole book on this, The Economics of the Stock Market. Uh, and I would point out that when, and I did this in my first book, I looked at the valuations of US equities at the four great bottoms. Turns out it was always at or below 10 times cyclically adjusted PE. If you look at when Mario Draghi uh, announced his fundamental shift in monetary policy, basically ignoring the, uh, the, the uh, whole constitution of the central, of the central bank, the, uh, the PE, the CAPE, was 10 times. Uh, if you look at when, interestingly, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority decided to get into the business of buying equities in 1998, the cyclically adjusted PE was 10 times. Now, I'm not for one instance suggesting that central bankers are looking at equity valuations when they make these huge changes in how they run monetary policy. But what I am saying is that when equities get to that sort of valuation, they're discounting or indicating such a dire economic outlook that these are the types of economic outlooks that do trigger a politician to move structurally to a new level of rates. And you know the reason for going through all that, Jack, is guess what? Chinese equities are at 10 times at cyclically adjusted PE. So I don't for a second think Xi Jinping's looking at that. But when you get to valuations like that, it's really forecasting some fairly dire outcomes. And in 1930, and in my four chapters in the book, there were monetary changes in 32, 49, and 82. I would say they were all structural changes, all associated with equity valuations forecasting deflation. So I think it's the same disease. And I think it has to be the same outcome. And just to absolutely reiterate this, it's not what people think it is. Hey, they're going to cut rates. Hey, they're, no, they're going to have to move to an entirely new form of monetary policy, which changes the world's monetary policy. And that's, you know, and that might be wrong, but that is the big call here. It's that forced deflation, very similar to what was going on in 1933 in the US, that forces a change in the global monetary system. So if we look at monetary policy as a three-legged stool of exchange rate policy, interest rate policy, and then quantity of money policy, controlling the price of money, the quantity of money, and the exchange of that relative to other currencies. So the Chinese system right now has a fixed rate of exchange. It does control the level of interest rates, at at least uh, superficially, but it also controls the amount of credit in the economy, which the Federal Reserve does not do. Uh, via window guidance. Basically, the government um, and I think the Chinese central bank tell Chinese state-owned banks how much to lend and in some cases to whom to lend. So it appears that China has a perfect control over its its monetary system. So what would the the shift that, that you see occurring in China and perhaps Japan, we'll go to Japan in a second. So would they 
withdraw one of the, the stools and, and relinquish control in, in one of those three areas? Yeah, so you're right. They have extra tools that the U.S. doesn't have. The first one you've mentioned is very important, their ability to control the growth of credit from the commercial banking system. And the second one is actually they have restrictions on capital outflows from locals. That also helps. That's going to help with your external accounts and it's going to help with management of the exchange rate. However, the big however is that the growth in reserves in China has really been going nowhere now for, well, nearly 10 years. And if the Chinese produce too many reserves or too few reserves, the economy ultimately responds to that. Those commercial bank reserves, by the way, let's just think of that as quantitative easing. If we were looking at this in the context of the Fed, we'd be talking about QE. So there's been no growth in that really for 10 years, very limited. Uh, and it could easily, if they have to intervene to support their exchange rate, those reserves would begin to shrink. So there is a link and there's a clear link. Even with these different things that the Chinese have going for them, there is still a link between monetary policy, certainly the quantity of narrow money, uh, the foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and if you just blow out the economy and let's say boost it to 15% real GDP growth, obviously your, your current account is going to get a lot worse anyway because your import growth is going to be high. So the links are not as clear as they would be in a full market economy with free capital movement, uh, as America did have in 1931, 32, and 33. So it's not like that. And it just explains why they're getting away with it for so long. Now, there's a consequence for that. And I've been writing for this, about this for a long time. I think the consequence for this really well before COVID was that it forced China to grow with more debt than money. That there's a form of debt in the system called non-bank debt. Uh, if a bank extends credit, as you've pointed out, it creates money and the government can control that. Uh, but there's non-bank debt. And the debt to GDP ratio of China has been rising at a pace never seen in human history in peacetime. There's just really nothing like this. For a major economy in peacetime, this has been absolutely unique. And I refer to the period post-2009. So I think, Jack, the consequences of trying to manage all three have been uh, that maybe they got away with it, but the consequence has been a rapid rise in debt to GDP. Now, we've just got the third quarter data out for last year in debt to GDP. China's got the only rising debt to GDP in the world. Everybody else is bringing it down. Nominal GDP growth has been quite high. Uh, price of debt, market price of debt's been falling. Uh, but in China, it's just gone to 311% of GDP. To put it into context, America's at 254. You know, we all know America's overgeared, it's got huge fiscal deficits, uh, but for the entire debt of the system, private plus public, China is much more geared. So I think the consequence has been that, which makes it even more dangerous now to go into debt deflation uh, with such high levels of, of debt. So some chickens are coming home to roost from trying to control all three, uh, because the consequence, I, I would put the consequence of that down as a massive rise in debt to GDP. What would you say are the causes of Chinese debt deflation right now? A a too expensive exchange rate that's non-competitive? Well, that's part of it. I mean, part of it is the external deficit, but I want to stress that part of that external deficit could be structural. If, if, if foreigners don't want to deal with China and if they want to pull their capital from China, you get a deficit on the external account, even if the exchange rate was competitive. And I think that's one of the most concerning things here for China is that there may not be a level of the exchange rate which is necessarily competitive if you're going into, into a Cold War. Uh, but the fundamental problem for China is it simply hasn't produced enough growth in money. Now, that's a peculiar thing to say, because the last growth in broad money for China was 8.7%. And let's face it, by global standards, that's a pretty high number. But by Chinese standards, it's right down towards the bottom end of the range. And it's maybe telling us something about China, that this is an economy which really needs high, very high levels of growth in, in broad money to not find itself in a debt trap, usually at 8.7%. We'd probably have inflation about four, even in a high growth economy like China. And uh, China finds itself with low CPI, low PPI, falling residential property prices. So the ultimate uh, problem here has been that it has produced uh, not sufficient money. And I, I would add to that that it's put too much bank credit into production and not enough into, into consumption. And that decision, and that's a Chinese Communist Party decision, means that you end up with more uh, deflation than you do inflation. And all of that has to change. You can, cannot keep going like this. So there's more to it than the value of the exchange rate. There's these other issues going on, on, on as well. But to some extent, this has been a crisis waiting to happen. Uh, and it's really a strange thing is it's taken so long. But the deterioration in China's relationships with the rest of the world are just really accelerating it.
And so we say uh, broad money, that is money that is in the bank accounts of citizens and, and companies and the private sector. Narrow money is money that's strictly within the financial sector. So you earlier said, talked about China's bank reserves. That is narrow money, something like M2, which you said is is now growing you know, at 8%, which is not enough. That is broad money. Is, is part of the reason that you think China needs such a huge amount of money growth to sustain its economy because it doesn't have bond markets and markets that we have in, in the in Europe and the US so that it's it's mostly bank driven which cap which is captured in broad money whereas bond issuance like we had a huge bond bubble or bubble is to be debated but in 2020 in America and that wasn't necessarily captured in M2. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would be absolutely categorical that M2 isn't broad enough, but it's what we've got. I'm sure there's something else going on in China because the informal system is so large. And one of the ways we could kind of reconcile 8.7% growth in, in broad money and where inflation is, is simply to say that actually it's, that's not a very good measure of broad money. And it's probably sold a lot faster than that because so much of money or quasi money was being generated by the private system. So we constantly come up against these uh, statistical problems with with uh, with China, and it seems, given the distress in credit, that the private sector credit system, which we can't really properly trace, the bit that works outside the banking system, may well be contracting, and a contraction in that bit may be causing problems uh, as well for the economy and for GDP. The, the the traceable, trackable debt in China is expanding faster than GDP, but I wonder if the private sector debt bit isn't already grinding to a level which is producing problems for the real estate market, for instance. Real estate in most economies is the major collateral for the entire system. So whatever we know about the private sector system in China, which is not very much, is that it may ultimately be backed by real estate. And if collateral values start coming down, as they did in America 2007, 2008, there could be something going very wrong in the private sector credit system which is having this impact on real GDP, even though the formal banking system looks like it's okay. But even that just looks okay. I mean, it's not really generating very high levels of bank credit growth. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. Russell, how would you characterize the tremendous appreciation and investment in real estate within China as you, you scour the historical archives? Is there any example in any country at any time of a real estate bubble as large as the one that China has experienced over the past 20 years? Well, well, definitely not in terms of the quantum of money, the quantum of the size of this thing, nothing. I mean, you'd have to then go back and look at it relative to GDP to get a, a better idea of this. There's been some spectacular ones as a percentage of GDP. So I wouldn't like to say that it's the biggest, because Australia in the late, 18, uh, late 19th century had one, which was spectacular. I mean, and of course, the GDP was tiny of Australia in the late 19th century. What I would say from that one is a long time since I looked at it. But if you take a price for Melbourne real estate in 1892, it doesn't get back in nominal terms to that level until 1952. So it's not necessarily a great thing to say the Chinese one may not be bigger than Australia in the late 19th century. But it's certainly for a major economy, there's, ne there's never been anything like this. And do you attribute the real estate bubble in China to the export-driven growth model? In other words, China accumulates a ton of foreign exchange reserves, mainly U.S. treasuries, and then uses that as collateral to issue a tremendous amount of bank credit to real estate firms. Yeah. So, I mean, a mechanics slightly different, but cause and effect the same. So it runs uh, a you know, massive boom in uh, commercial bank reserves all the way up until 2014. Commercial banks respond to the rise in reserves by lending more money, and more money goes into uh, residential real estate. And that's just the formal sector. And outside the formal sector, there's lots more money going into residential real estate. So the yeah the, the the external surpluses translated into far too loose a monetary policy, which was steered into real estate. I think the state bears some responsibility for that. 
they were quite keen it wouldn't get into wages in a dramatic way. I mean, it has got into wages because it just ran for so long. But what you really didn't want it was all that excess credit growth to, to end up in, in, in being turned into wage growth and therefore making you uncompetitive very quickly. So by filtering a lot of it into investment, and a lot of that's not residential property, but productive capacity, they were able to keep a cap on inflation and stay competitive longer than they otherwise would be. But I think quite a lot of it spilt over into credit for residential real estate. And that's what residential real estate bubbles are built on. They're built on credit. They're not built on, on cash. So the inability to do anything about that, to really contain the growth in credit, was a product of trying to hold out the exchange rate. So, you know, we always come back to those three things. Can you control all of them? Well, with China, they could do a better job at controlling all of them, but ultimately they can't control and did not control all of them. And that led to this massive imbalance. The, the monetary change that you see in China, that is China, is it moving to a flexible exchange rate? And is are they doing anything else in terms of affecting the quantity of, of money or the price of money, i.e. interest rates, or is it just the flexible exchange rate? So I look at it the other way, Ryan. If, if you and I wanted to run an economy where we had complete control over the price of money and therefore could steer the quantity of money, we would have to move to a flexible exchange rate. So the flexible exchange rate is a product. I think one of the reasons that many people argue against the flexible exchange rate is to say, well, they don't want to devalue the exchange rate. Well, maybe they don't want to devalue the exchange rate, but I do think they want to control the price and quantity of money and then the exchange rate adjusts accordingly. Uh, if a country like New Zealand can have a uh, flexible exchange rate, why can't China? So it's it's the price you pay for having a genuinely independent monetary policy. It's not, a, it's not the end product. It's not what you're aiming to achieve. It's what you end up with when you pursue a new policy which gives you complete independence. I gather you think it is unlikely that China can continue to control the quantity of money and bank credit while keeping a fixed exchange rate. Can you ex explain why you think that is unlikely? In other words, why do you think it's unlikely that Premier Xi goes on t television tomorrow and says the state-owned banks are turning the credit spigots back on, Evergrande is emerging from bankruptcy, and this bubble is going to get bigger than ever, and by the way, there's going to be no move in the exchange rate. It's going to remain fixed. Why can't that happen? Or why is it unlikely to happen? If he's basically saying is, I'm opening the spigots on, on bank credit, therefore I'm opening the spigots on money creation, therefore I'm opening the spigots on the level of nominal GDP growth, and nominal GDP growth is going to be much higher. If nominal GDP growth is much higher, he's going to have much higher levels of imports. His current account surplus, which is already relatively small to GDP, could disappear overnight at a time when he already has a capital account deficit. So he can say all of that. There's massive downward pressure on the exchange rate. Uh, if he wants to react to that massive downward pressure on the exchange rate, then it's intervention selling you at United States treasuries, but that is tightening domestic monetary policy. So that's the triangle he keeps finding himself in. Uh, I do think he's going to say this, by the way, and I don't know it's going to be tomorrow, Jack. I don't really know when it's going to be, but I think that he absolutely will say all of those things. But when he says all of those things, everybody will realize that they're incompatible with also managing the exchange rate. The reason he's in this mess is because he's, you know, he's he's asked the central bank to pursue policies that are compatible with a stable exchange rate. So he can't do all three because he, his external accounts would get significantly worse. If he, I mean, he might accelerate capital outflow from locals who would be concerned uh, about the, um, the let's put it the real value of the RMB. So there's all sorts of moving parts here, even in China which suggests that that announcement would not be compatible with a stable exchange rate. And you said something earlier about how if the foreign exchange reserves, holdings, Chinese holdings of U.S. treasuries were to decline, that would not support a growth in bank credit. That kind of makes me think about the gold standard, about how credit creation hinged upon how much gold the, the country had. Do you think that the dollar standard right that we have right now is similar to the gold standard for non-US countries. In other words, bank credit really is hindered by its holdings of, of US treasuries, or will the, will, the, will the pressure escape via the currency route as well? Yeah, so the difference is that that was the gold standard, all the currencies were linked, and of course they're not anymore. I mean, the, the euro is not linked to the dollar, the pound is not linked to anything. Most countries in the world run with fully flexible exchange rates. So that linkage that we had in the gold standard simply doesn't exist. We're talking about China because it's decided not to run a flexible exchange rate. But you can pick other countries in the world as well. For anybody watching this who wants to work out who they are, 
you just simply track their foreign exchange reserves. It's not always possible to track it via the exchange rate itself. It won't necessarily go flat across the page. So you can look at that. So China's put itself in a particularly difficult position. But if you were to take the United Kingdom, for instance, the Bank of England is in complete control of the level of reserves of the commercial banking system. It would not be in control of that if it was linking its currency to, you know, as it did under the gold standard. So uh, this is something that China has chosen to do, but it is a choice. It's, you know, most people don't run this system anymore. They leave the supply of reserves entirely up to their own central bank. Uh, We always focus on America and say, because it has the reserve currency status, it can do this. But look, from 2009 to 2019, the entire developed world was doing this. And they just let the currencies find their own level. If if we all assumed that, you know, France or the whole Eurozone was creating too much high powered money, bank reserves, uh, then it was all going to come out through the exchange rate. It makes it very difficult. This is the problem with the system that we live in. The previous systems we lived in, basically everybody agreed to manage their exchange rates at certain levels with certain rules. But the thing is, China went it alone and went it alone when it was tiny, but it's now big and it finds itself in a different position from most other uh, central bankers. And so you referenced earlier how when a country's stock market tends to have a declined to a level of very low valuation of a 10 price to 10 a 10 price to earnings ratio that is when there tends to be a monetary sea change uh, tell us about the uh, Chinese stock market you know since its pegged as currency in 1994 Chinese GDP has gone up thousands and thousands of percent the stock market is is close to to flat does that seem peculiar to you it, de- it definitely does to a lot of people I think yeah, so I was there when it opened, so it wasn't that peculiar to me. So uh, February 1992, I was a fund manager in Edinburgh, and the first stocks came that were available for, for foreigners to purchase. There was a few things listed in Hong Kong, sort of historical anachronisms, really. They just happened to have a China exposure, but the first the first stocks came. So I went to see those stocks, and that's when Morgan Stanley started its China index. It's not that, that China index is a very bad index, very unrepresentative. You can imagine it's very unrepresentative because it starts with probably one stock in 1992. It's actually down 50% since 1992. Now, that's just the capital index. Obviously, there's been been dividends underway. So so somebody was there to watch those first stocks list. How come they were so bad? Right? Their returns have been so bad. So I'd, I'd point to you know, a series of things, three things. Number one, they were really bad companies. Now, you've got to remember, 92 is, is when they list. 95 is when the dot-com thing starts. You know, America creates some of the world's greatest companies. China's listing state-run companies. What happens next? So, of course, there was this belief that if you buy into a high-growth economy, you'll make money in equities. Well, it's not true if you buy really bad companies. I remember very well going to see Wing Sun Stationery, a company that made pens. It was actually owned by the People's Liberation Army. Uh, they gave me a pen, uh, and I took it back from lunch, and it fell apart after lunch. So as the market opened up, as the economy opened up, guess what? Other pen companies were going to do better. So the first thing is the quality of these companies, the early ones anyway, were really bad. And the second one was valuations. You know, the famous Buffett saying, price is what you pay, value is what you get. There was a scarcity value. There was an amusement value almost, and people overpaid for these things on the listing. And then the third one, I think, is the most interesting of all. In the... uh, pitches for these companies, the investment bankers were telling us that you had to buy the stocks because the economy was going to grow at 8% for 30 years. Now, nobody believed that because we'd never really seen an economy of this size like that before. But on the whole, China delivered on growth. But what amazed everybody was its ability to deliver on supply. So one of the companies that listed them was China Southern Glass, which has done a bit better than the others. But what we could not have forecast is just how rapidly China could bring on supply in gas. So, you know, an equity is not the economy. Uh, and if supply drives grows even faster than demand, then you can have really bad returns. So I think those are the three things that probably played the biggest role in stopping you get a decent return on Chinese, on those particular Chinese equities, even though the stock market did very well. And uh, people don't want to hear that story because everybody wants to hear, you know, there's a valuation and the lower valuation, you buy it. But there was something structurally different in China and I would argue very, very strongly that under the current leadership, those structural problems remain. Uh, I mean, there are opportunities, if you, not if, when Xi announces a massive change in, in the structure of monetary policy. But the question is, are those other things changed? Uh, do you own the property in China? Are you subjected to the same property rights as you would be in the United States or the United Kingdom? Uh, is there a risk that assets can be sequestered? 
these are are we going to be in the middle of a cold war where you can't get your money out the way you can't get your money out of of Russia? So the ten times cape has really been a very good signal of a good time to buy equities, and, and maybe on a trading basis it still is. But there are times, and I, I flag this up in my course, there are times when ten times cape is pretty useless, um, particularly if you move into a situation of communism. If you go to a world war and all your capital stock gets destroyed by enemy bombing, or if you find yourself in a monetary system which you can't control, such as Greece did in 2008, 2009, I could go on and on about the reasons why Chinese equities didn't deliver. In aggregate, some of them did, but in aggregate, they didn't deliver. But I would put it there, and I would also suggest that nothing, not much has changed. Uh, one final thing, I wrote for clients, I can't remember when it was now, probably about 2006, a piece comparing China and India. Uh, and it was called Buy Chaos, Sell Order. Uh, and it was saying that from the seeming chaos of India, order would form, and then equity valuations would begin to reflect the fact that order was forming from chaos. Whereas in China, everybody I knew was buying it, was buying it because of the order, which was tremendously orderly. The Chinese Communist Party can get things done. Uh, and I don't know, human history is more about how those things break down. Now, it can take a long, long, long time for that kind of, orderly system to deliver bad returns or chaotic returns. But I think that is one of the things. The order that the Chinese Communist Party tries to bring is not necessarily compatible with good returns on capital, whereas from the chaos of India, good returns on capital started to, to form. Uh, long, long answer, but it's, uh, but it's a fascinating question, isn't it? How on earth can you buy the fastest growing economy in the world and lose money in the equity market over a 30-year period? It really is. Uh, in our first conversation, Russell, you said that it, it's often a mistake for investors to buy very cheap companies. Instead, they should try to buy cheap currencies. What did you mean by that? And how does that apply to the situation in China now, where you say the currency might be not cheap, but equities are superficially exceptionally cheap? Yeah. So this, this only applies where there's a management of the exchange rate underway. Because that choice on the exchange rate is having a direct impact on monetary policy. If the currency is cheap, maybe like Japan, not because necessarily there's any intervention going on, then it doesn't apply. There'll be other things that apply to Japan. We might come back to those. But when, you, uh, when the currency is managed and you buy a cheap exchange rate, what it means is there'll be, there'll be an external surplus and the government, is, central bank, is monetizing the external surplus. In other words, the foreign exchange reserves are going up, but the level of bank commercial currency, domestic currency bank reserves are going up, so they're creating too much liquidity. They're not in control of that either. It's completely beyond their control. So they're likely to create excess liquidity. Liquidity is likely to be uh, not in equilibrium. There are many ways that uh, liquidity not in equilibrium can turn up, but one of the ways is usually in liquid assets. and The equity market is a liquid asset. So I think that's why you're looking for undervalued exchange rates because you're more likely to get a monetary disequilibrium and that disequilibrium feeds into to equity. So to take one end of that extreme, uh, Taiwan back in the late 1980s, ran a huge current account surplus, restricted uh, capital outflows, and I think at peak it was on 65 times earnings. Well, foreigners have been, to the extent that foreigners could participate at all, which frankly wasn't very much, but to the extent that you could, uh, most foreigners would have sold it at 20 because they were comparing it to a reasonable range of a reasonable uh, PE in a, in a market economy with a flexible exchange rate. And in that economy, the Federal Reserve or the Monetary Authority tries to keep money not in particularly big disequilibrium. They, they strive for equilibrium. Uh, they don't always achieve it. But when you have this fixed target, you get massive disequilibrium. And Taiwan, by the way, only I think it's only two years ago, got above its 1989 level. We, we keep talking about Japan in this regard, but actually Taiwan was a, was another one. So this now takes us back to um, back to China, which is at the other end of the other end of the problem. Now it is at ten times, but I think it'll go lower unless they decide to reflate. And the question is, have they got the tools to reflate? My opinion is that they don't unless they move to a flexible exchange rate. So I think he'll have to do that, and that is why you know over and over and over again. Central bankers have taken the decision to do something big and structural in nature because of the consequences if it gets down there. There are people I meet all the time who think that Xi wants to own the entire private sector, and therefore he will continue with this, bankrupt all of it, 
and it will all fall into the hands of the state. So this is this is why it's difficult because of the political economy. Now, there may be people watching this who want to trade Chinese equities because he will have to, I think, reflate. But it's a very dangerous game because against this game of short-term gain, there is this problem of the geopolitical deterioration going on. And perhaps the movement in the exchange rate exacerbates the geopolitical deterioration. So you know, I'm on record as saying, so I better might as well repeat it, that the terminal value for foreigners' investments in China is zero. In the same way that Sperbank is zero, has a ruble price, but one cannot, or one would find it very difficult, let's put it that way, to sell the Sperbank, get the rubles and change them into dollars. I think that is the ultimate destination for investments in China. By the way, the data is on the net international investment position that foreigners still have over 6 trillion US dollars invested. In China, half of that is in the form of direct investment, but half of it is in the form of liquid investment, which would be primarily bonds, equities, loans, and and cash, uh, local currency loans and local currency cash. So there's still a hell of a big commitment of foreign investors uh, into that into that economy. In the in the example of Thailand, uh, uh, for example, you know, we, we've talked about before about how as the uh, Thai, Thailand's stock market declined, it got optically cheaper and cheaper to fund managers despite the fact that the currency pressure that, that you had been seeing for a while was only continuing to, to build. Can you talk about how companies in China, I mean, you, you I know, I'm sure, talk to many investors who say Alibaba is so cheap, Tencent, so cheap. You know, JD.com, it has a PE to ratio of five. How can I lose? Russell, I've got this margin of safety. How does all of the macro imbalances and the structural currency issues we, we, we've been discussing how does that make JD.com not a bargain at, at five price to earnings ratio? Well, I can certainly talk to Thailand as to how it happened there. And that is the, the earnings were false. So you're working out the low valuation on the earnings, but the earnings were false because they were based upon an entirely wrong discount rate. And they were based upon the ability to borrow very cheaply in local currency and foreign currency. Uh, and when you did that, you had an inflated level of earnings. So when you then reset the interest rate, in their case, to a proper level, suddenly the earnings disappeared. So there was, a, let's call it financial engineering underway. And that financial engineering was inflating earnings. So if we'd been smart enough or able to strip out the financially engineered portion of Thai earnings, we would have found those stocks were quite expensive. Now, I uh, I don't know the Chinese stocks in as much detail. I'm not, I'm really fairly sure that they're not as, as heavily involved in this as the Thais were. Certainly the aggregate data for the macro data for foreign currency debt doesn't suggest anything like a degree of foreign currency arbitrage underway that we had. Uh, but that said, if you're trying to work this out, I mean, what, look, is a devaluation good for equities or bad for equities? Well, in the case of Thailand, it was bad for equities. In the case of the United Kingdom, it was good for equities. What's the difference? The difference was when the UK devalued in 92, it didn't, you know, people had not been borrowing in uh, Deutschmarks. They'd not been borrowing in dollars. So uh, it, it produced a monetary relief, much easier monetary policy, without any of the damage associated with, my goodness, we can't pay back our foreign currency debts. And when Thailand did it, well, it was completely different. They couldn't pay back the foreign currency debt. It was questionable whether there was any equity in the companies at all. Now, I don't think there's many Chinese companies that would actually ha have a huge hit to earnings or a huge hit to the condition of their balance sheet from a devaluation. So I, I don't think, uh, and this is as the top-down guy here, that actually a devaluation of the, I mean, these, these stocks are cheap on that perspective. And if monetary policy eases, they will go up. That's not my quibble on why they go to zero, as you can imagine. I'm not saying they go to zero because they don't have any earnings. I wouldn't say they go to zero because we find ourselves in a cold war with China, and it effectively becomes illegal to own Chinese corporations. The most likely path for China is it moves to a flexible exchange rate, much easier monetary policy. And the stock market goes up much, much faster than the currency comes down. And if one is nimble, there is a trading opportunity there. But as an investor, you still face this existential threat in this relationship between China and the rest of the world. And I think that goes in a different direction. So this may just go to trading or investing uh, and where you draw the line. But I'm relatively confident that it doesn't, you know, these earnings are not overinflated by financial engineering slash foreign currency borrowing to the extent anyway, to the huge extent that Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia were in 97, 98. So uh, those Southeastern countries in the late 90s had uh, artificially low borrowing costs because they were 
loading up their balance sheets with a very cheap dollar denominated debt. They can't print dollars. They can only print their local currencies. You say that China, which does not have a large amount of dollar denominated debt as a percentage, it could be more similar to the UK. In other words, if and when it does reflate, that would be a you know, a bullish move net for Chinese equities. Your concern about it being a zero is more of a rusted situation, geopolitical, not something on the flows we've discussed. Russell, talk about uh, when a currency gets devalued to, let's say, a British investor in Japanese stocks or a US investor in Japanese stocks has gained a tremendous amount in Japanese yen terms, even as the yen has devalued, and how you know, you're sort of moving two steps forward in valuation terms, but then you're moving one step back because the currency is being de- depreciated. Uh, how do you sort of think about that? Yeah, so it starts. It depends on the valuation you start on, and we're starting on a very low Chinese valuation, at least a headline valuation. I think it's gen- a genuine valuation. I think they really are as probably as cheap as they look. Now, so let's take 10 times cyclically adjusted PE. Well, look, even if they only got to the level of valuation of the United Kingdom, you'd be you'd be making 40%. If they get to the level of the United States, they're going from 10 to 32. Now, obviously, just somewhere in between is probably the right answer. So the, the rise in valuation, when you get monetary relief, that tells you these things are actually solvent now, that they're not going to run out of cash flow, that the earnings are real. The rise in valuation can easily be 40 to 50% quite quickly. Now, against that, the exchange rate can be going down as well. But it's really quite unlikely that it's going down by 40, 50%. So in that effect, as long as you haven't done any permanent damage to the balance sheets by having far too much unhedged foreign currency debt, the net effect between the two is that the dollar value probably goes up. Now, you can hedge your currency. Certainly, institutional investors can hedge their currency risk, so they would do even better. Uh, we, we keep coming back to the same problem about all of this. It's very difficult to know when the president of China will make this decision. I think it's much easier to know when a democratically elected politician would make these decisions. There's a certain amount of pain in the local economy that no politician democratically elected would want to see because it would mean they wouldn't get elected. But actually forecasting when Xi will make this decision is is more difficult. Currency down, equities up, even in even in dollar terms, I think the, the value of Chinese equities would be up in this scenario. But it doesn't change my long-term view as to where the ultimate destination for the, the price and valuation of Chinese equities. And so the U.S. dollar relative to a very high yielding currency, such as, let's say, the Turkish lira, an immense amount of depreciation is priced into the Turkish lira against the dollar going forward. But interestingly, so you think the Chinese yuan will devalue, but I believe Chinese interest rates are lower than the U.S. So is the market just exceptionally wrong? Uh, in other words, a, a, a pre, an appreciation is priced for the yuan, but you think it will depreciate? Yeah, so the, the market's not wrong. It just doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> you know, there is a market, obviously. You know, it's a bit, that's a bit of a facetious comment, but it's not a true market for, you know, China came from communism, but in the process to where it's got to has retained many of the aspects of a financial repression. So these Chinese interest rates do not really reflect anything that the market's saying. Uh, I, w- I would look more at the net errors and omissions on the uh, balance mm-hmm. of payments to tell you what the market really thinks about the, the Chinese uh, exchange rate, but I don't think we'll see it in, in interest rates. You know, it's it's you know going back to the the Thai example. One of the reasons that we began to get an inkling that this was coming is from the summer of '96. Market rates started to tick up, and started to go up and up and up and up, and that's not happening in China. And I think it's just because of the way the Chinese authorities control the financial system and how the capital controls work somewhat, if not perfectly. So I don't think the rate of interest can tell us very much. It may be why, as you know, Jack, uh, if you're shorting the currency, the interest rate differential plays a key role in pricing that. And it may be, you know, that interest differential is currently pretty positive. And it's one of the reasons why it's actually quite cheap to short their NMB. So their currency manipulation, sorry, their interest rate manipulation will help you with that. Uh, But I speak to a lot of professional investors all the time, and they're just convinced that Xi doesn't like this sort of thing. So this sort of thing isn't going to happen, which may be another reason why interest rates stay low. The great great hunger of foreign investors for Chinese government bonds, though, is over. That has come to an end. So maybe that's telling you something. Moving a little bit east, the Japanese interest rates remain exceptionally low uh, at or, or very close to zero. And the yen has devalued. How can the yen devalue further? And do you think that the Bank of Japan can maintain zero rates on the 
uh, front end and you know, yield curve control near zero rates on the, the long end as well. Yeah, not doing what they're currently doing. So the reason the yen is so cheap is because they are continuing effectively with quantitative easing, whereas others have stopped or even reversing it. And that is why the yen's got excessively cheap. And it is excessively cheap. Uh, but it can get worse. It can go lower if they continue to do this because uh, in an era where we have more inflation in the world, if you continue to, to create high-powered money through quantitative easing, uh, you can get yourself into a very nasty inflationary spiral. It takes a bit longer for imported inflation to hit CPI in, in Japan, probably because of its very convoluted uh, distribution lines, but it does get there eventually. Uh, and when you have that and you keep printing more money, I think that's a road to disaster. So the market's assumption is that the Japanese will respond to this by raising rates. My assumption is that they won't, uh, not that they wouldn't in the short run, but in the long run, the way to square this circle, to underpin your exchange rate while keeping your interest rates artificially low relative to inflation, to inflate away your debt, is to demand that Japanese savings institutions buy more JGBs. So I think that is where we're going to end up. There may be one initial attempt to get interest rates higher, but when we end up there, that's a capital inflow into the end. It's a strong yen, and it's a low Chinese, and it's a sustained low interest rate for JGBs. I think it continues to be positive for equities. The rise in the yen means there's a reset domestically. Some equities don't like a higher yen, exporters obviously being one of them. Uh, but once we get past that reset, then that's the situation we're in. Now, the problem with that is they're going to be selling foreign assets. The Japanese will be selling foreign assets. Their number one foreign asset by denomination is dollars, which wouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, but I think the rate surprised just about everybody when you look at the, uh, the portfolio data is that France is number two. So in this great globe change in global monetary policy, we focused a lot on China uh, and why the movement in that exchange rate could be important. But for Japan, the, the reason this would be important on a global basis is repatriation of capital to purchase JGBs because it's too dangerous for the Bank of Japan to do so. That also has a major impact on the, the global monetary system. It would be too dangerous for the Bank of Japan to continue to buy Japanese assets because why? The yen would depreciate further? So in buying the assets, that's the, that's the asset side of their balance sheet expanding. They're also expanding the liability side. The liability side is... Uh, Yen denominated bank reserves, as we as you know as we've seen for a long time, you can get away with doing that as long as your banking system isn't creating credit and, and creating uh, more money, and the world isn't full of inflation. So I think we've just moved fundamentally to a different type of world, particularly if China's being closed off to us with more inflation, and it becomes very dangerous for the Japanese to keep putting more high powered money into the system. So the way you don't have to do that is if you find somebody else to buy all these bonds at artificially low yields. Uh, and you know, I think that's where the whole world ends up. But Japan may be closer to that than others because of where it's got to with this exchange rate. And it's got to a dangerously low level. We, we find them, I don't think they've done it recently, but certainly last year they were often intervening to try and support the exchange rate, which is kind of nuts, doing quantitative easing at one end of the balance sheet and trying to buy back the currency on the other end of the balance sheet. It shows a kind of uh, schizophrenia, which has to be settled. Uh, but at least it shows that they care about the level of the exchange rate. So there is another way where you do have your cake and eat it. That is, you do keep interest rates low and you do have a strong yen. But it's once again by effectively ending a market by saying you will buy, by, you know, savings institutions of Japan, you will sell your oversized assets and you will buy these JGBs. Uh, and that is not a market solution, but it is a solution. It's interesting because it's the sort of thing that you pick up as a financial historian, but you don't pick up as an economist because economists are trained to believe that there's only one system, it's a market system. Uh, but this is a political economy system, and that's why uh, it may, uh, you know, it, it, that implementation changes the global monetary system, but it's unexpected because it is actually moving away from a free market. With the benefit of hindsight, what has the results of the immense amount of quantitative easing in Japan been? As you said, the Bank of Japan bought hundreds and hundreds of trillion of yen worth of Japanese assets, uh, equities as well as bonds. And on the liability side, it issued yen denominated bank reserves to the commercial banking system. I think many at the time, uh, and you know, many still expected that to be result in an immense devaluation of the yen or an immense amount of monetary inflation. But we haven't seen that at all. What does that say to you? What, what learnings are there from, from that instance? 
Well, I think we learned a lot with, from quantitative easing and not just in Japan. So in general, across the planet, what we saw is a massive increase in bank, commercial bank reserves, but the banks didn't match that by growing their balance sheets. So we didn't get this growth in broad money. And that wasn't just a Japanese phenomenon. That was a, a global phenomenon. But what it did was drive up asset prices. The, the money that the assets that were purchased tend to be purchased from savings institutions. Savings institutions were flushed with cash. And a savings institution flush with cash buys more assets. And uh, therefore, as in America, as in anywhere else, as in Japan, it tended to push those up. I think more interestingly in Japan is what the impact that this QE had on foreign assets. Japan, Japan runs a large current account surplus. Uh, it's always going to be an exporter of, of capital. But by finding this particular buyer for JGBs uh, in, the, in the form of the uh, central bank, it allowed more capital to go offshore. Into offshore and you know into foreign bond markets and foreign equity markets. So the the, the activities of the Bank of Japan were actually quite similar. Uh, the problem for the, the Japanese is they've been doing it for twenty odd years. They, the rest they only did it for ten years. But in that ten years, not dissimilar to the effect it had in America, but in a current account surplus country, I think it had a, a major profound role in allowing even more capital to to escape and go out and, and play around the rest of the world. When you talk about the, the JGBs, people say, oh, don't worry about the JGBs. The Japanese have got enough savings to, to buy all those. Well, they do, but they've not been using them to buy them because the central bank's been buying. The central bank's been creating liquidity out of thin air to buy them. And if that burden was to fall back upon the Japanese savers, as I think it will, slowly, not quickly, they have to liquidate other assets. And I'm convinced that a large proportion of those other assets will be offshore. So I think it did play a role in the sort of more bull markets going on offshore than it did even necessarily on the onshore onshore asset markets. We talked at length about the change in Chinese monetary policy. So what exactly do you think the, the shift from the from J- the Japanese monetary authority will be? Can you flesh that out more in more detail? Yeah, so they will pick a yield curve and they will announce yield curve control, but the purchasing of JGBs to, to, to manage that yield will be driven around forcing savings institutions to buy those bonds. That, that, is, the period, that is what America did during uh, World War II. It's a standard wartime finance. And uh, you can bolster that by using the commercial banking system as well, a, a, an institution that can expand its balance sheet. So between the commercial banking system and the savings system, we have yield curve control, not using the central bank balance sheet. Do you think that that is coming to the U.S.? I do. Uh, I just don't know when. I think it's potentially further away. It's uh, much more politically uh, <laughs> fraught for the U.S., let us just say, given where American politics are. Uh, but you can see it happening. I mean, there's, a number, there's a number one catalyst to make all this happen quickly, which is a spike in bond yields to a level that makes it difficult to run a government. So that can bring it to the U.S. I don't know what that level will be, Jack, but uh, there is a level in, in which even the U.S. will say we've got two options here, cut spending or force our savings institutions to buy government bonds. And I think it's going to be the latter. I don't think it will be the, you know, the American state downsizing to fit the savings. I think it'll be corralling, press ganging the savings to fit the spending. It's hard to know when that might happen. But we've had fairly high levels of rates recently without America getting to that level. I think Japan is probably first there. When we spoke two years ago, the short-term interest rate was literally zero in the US. You know, The 10-year was probably 2 to, to 3%. And many at the time were said that the, the US can't handle uh, higher interest rates for one of two reasons. Number one, the private sector can't handle it because it won't generate enough income to pay off the debt. And number two, the U.S. government can't handle it because it just won't be able to afford it. I think with the benefit of, of hindsight, both of those have not uh, played out, at least yet. In the U.S., corporates and households borrowed an immense amount of money at a very long duration fixed rate uh, mortgage. So the stress is much less than anticipated. And on the government side, we just haven't haven't really uh, uh, seen it. You know, how, how would you explain on the government side just... You know, everyone was wrong. No, the U.S. can handle a, a sufficiently higher level of rates. Why is that the case? So the analysis is absolutely right. And the data, we'll, we'll just do the private sector first, because not everybody's like America. You have to look at the private sector debt service ratios for the whole world. And that would have told you, you know, two years ago, that rising rates were not going to cause distress in the U.S. credit system, because actually it was very low, that the percentage of 
interest income being paid by American private sector was very low relative to income. So as rates went up, it was going to go up, but it wasn't going to reach a, a dangerous level. So in the private sector, I think you can explain that. One of the better ones actually is the United Kingdom, which also surprises people. But it's worth pointing out there are several countries where it's very, very high and rising. Uh, and they would be uh, Korea, Australia, Norway, Sweden, Canada, and Brazil. So I think some chickens will come home to roost with rising rates, but not America in the private sector and not the United States. The ability of the um, of all of our countries to get away with is the ability to sell debt. Uh, interest rates are coming back down again. And as long as you can keep selling it at, a, at this rate, it looks like you are sustainable. The question is, is this rate the right rate? I obviously think it's the wrong rate. I think rates are going to go higher. I don't think rates are going to go lower. So, uh, yeah, they got away with it for a bit. Uh, there's a thing that happens here, and I would call it the ambush. The ambush is when you create a lot of inflation and you surprise bond investors, and you do very well from this. You know, most countries in the world have seen their debt to GDP ratio collapse in the last six quarters because their nominal GDP is up and the price of government bonds are down. I think the 30-year treasury, you still lost 40% on it. So remember, this is a transfer of wealth actually away from savers to the government. Now, in that first stage, people, you know, the collapse is give, the collapse then gives you higher rates. And then as you go forward, you've got to borrow with the higher rates. That's the difficult bit. But in the bit of the ambush, things actually look a bit better. And I call it an ambush because an ambush is a surprise attack. There's not going to be another surprise attack. You know, you know, I, I won't try and repeat the great George Bush adage, you know, fill me once. But anyway, you get the, you get the idea. So uh, I think the ambush kind of made things better initially, but they make things worse in the long run because presumably people aren't stupid enough to lend you money at low rates again next time. And then as you refinance and you refinance, this begins to tick in the wrong direction for you. Do you think that high interest rates for the government is inflationary because it's just paying more and more or deflationary? So it should be deflationary because it should trigger the government to change its behavior, but it won't. It will ultimately prove out to be inflationary. It'll just stimulate the government into generating more inflation to solve the problem. So uh, whether it's directly inflationary or not, I don't have a strong opinion. Uh, but the worse government finances get, the more inflation we're going to get. So what you've just described to me is a deterioration in government finances, which must end up with more inflation because they couldn't contemplate the deflationary approach to dealing with this, which is to borrow less. So, Russell, we, we began by saying that you think the monetary shift that is going to occur in Asia, China and Japan specifically, might be of the magnitude of the world going off the gold standard, the U.S. going off the, the gold standard in, in 1933. Uh, can you explain how it might be as uh, momentous and how it might be in the death of the age of debt. Because you know, I could see China moving to a flexible exchange rate, Japan moving off yield curve control, mildly raising interest rates, Im imposing a mild amount of financial repression. How does that get us to the magnitude of a Bretton Woods, the magnitude of going off the gold standard, you know, which had been a, a benchmark for you know, global money for thousands and thousands of years? Yeah, well, where, where it leaves us is with excessively high levels of debt. Now, I mentioned they'd come down a lot in the last six quarters, but they're still excessively high in the developed world. So I think the best way to work out, well, what, what monetary policy do we, the developed world, adapt when this all changes? It has to be a monetary policy that inflates away that debt. Now, that, I mean, I, I didn't really mean to say that it would be as momentous as the gold standard, but certainly as momentous as the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement where we were, you know, even then we didn't have debt levels of this side. We'd already been inflating away the debts. So think a bit more of the Bretton Woods Agreement and just how far inflation had to go. And capital controls, and I keep coming back to that. It's very difficult to inflate away your debts without capital controls. So in terms of how this can be absolutely momentous for people who are investing, a uh, higher rate of inflation is one of them. Forced purchases of government bonds is another one. But then restrictions on the free movement of capital. Now, in terms of the magnitude of earthquakes that can affect investors, that's pretty big. Now, whether it's as big as the gold standard or bigger than Bretton Woods, those three things are absolutely massive. You, and because what you're getting is the government getting back into the business of allocating private sector savings. That's pretty much as, as big as it gets. And that's why this is a big change. If the governments are successful in having forcing the private sector to use savings to buy government paper, wouldn't that not be inflationary because it wouldn't be inflated with bank credit? Or in other words, if you have three entities who can buy government uh, bonds, it's 
commercial banks by issuing deposits. It's the private sector by using their savings, which already exists, so not creating new money. And it's the central bank, but which you know, issuing bank reserves. Which uh, party do you think will be dominant going forward? Yeah, I think it'll be using private sector savings. The, the banks themselves, part of the financial repression is to use the banks to certainly create money, but that will be used to fund other things, fund the green agenda, fund building all the capacity that we don't no longer import from China. So absolutely, and you're absolutely correct about this, using the banking system to generate more credit and money is really important part of this. Uh, and you can use it to fund the government bond market, but it's much more valuable somewhere else. You want to try and bring down debt to GDP. Ironically, you do that by having a growth in bank debt growing at that rate, and you try to stabilize non-growth in non-bank debt, which may be more um, MBS, could be uh, commercial paper, could be even government bonds, which I think is a bit less likely, but anyway. So the banks are in a crucial part of financial repression. Well, uh, Russell, it's been it's wonderful getting a chance to, to pick your brain. Uh, people should definitely uh, check out your book, The Asian Financial Crisis, Birth of the, of the Age of Debt. And also, you know, viewers will know, we, we did not really talk that much about uh, the impact of your views on the monetary system in, in Asia on asset markets. Uh, and, you know, if people want to know that, they, they've got to sub uh, subscribe to your newsletter, The, the Solid Ground. And my final question for you, a bit difficult. What do you think that folks in, in the investment world are not paying attention to that they, they should, one of the, the, the you know, most undervalued factors in the market? Well, the easiest thing would be to say everything we've just talked about. Well, that would be the easy, the easy answer. Uh, you know, in, in researching Anatomy of the Bear, my first book, I read all these Wall Street journals around the bottom of, of markets. And what I discovered is that you really, really don't want to read the first four pages of the newspaper. It's a perfect snapshot of consensus. It's, it's, where, the, it's where all the wrong questions are asked at the wrong time. Uh, and you need to look from the middle onwards. And I think when you start looking at the middle onwards, you see lots of evidence of this building financial repression. So, Jack, the, the, the biggest mistake is to believe that the only form of system that we can devise is a market system. And most people in the markets believe that. They believe it ideologically as well. They've been educated in it, and they can't foresee that we would be stupid enough to go to a different system. And that's the great jump you have to make and say. And, and lots of people who, who live and work in emerging markets know this exists because they work underneath it. So you have to say that there's this other way it can be done. And I think we've just come to believe that there's only one way it can be done. And that's the mistake. You have to make this conceptual leap to say there is another way this can be done. And the asset allocation to defend your savings is completely different in that new system. But most investors, professional investors, could not do that. It's such a huge risk to say all the rules of the old game are finished. Here's the new game, and we're giving you a portfolio for that. It's just not the way the business works. And that's, I think, the main mistake. Russell, thank you so much for joining, sharing your views. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at jackfarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.